Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057 Introduction to Law. This is week 11 of Term 3 in 2017. Well, we're down to the pointy end. Um, you now have your results and feedback for the second assessment. You'll know where you stand and you'll recall that um, the criteria for passing this subject is quite simple and that is you get 50% of the overall. So I think from memory, um, we've got one student that's around the, what is the mark? Is that we're out of um, 60 at the moment. So up around 56, 57. Um, so some, some of you have already passed the subject. Now it's a matter of just trying to um, shoot for the credits and the distinctions and the high distinctions. The way in which it works is that I don't mark off a bell curve. In other words, there's no theoretical impediment to everyone getting a HD or everyone failing the subject. So it's not as though I have a certain limit in terms of um, the results that I hand out overall. Tonight we'll talk more about the examination, some of the specifics involved in that examination. Um, and of course, as usual, you can unmute your microphone or use the chat facility to ask any questions. So um, I want to just do a quick refresher on legal ethics, something that I probably just want to stress from last week's talk. Are there any questions before I start to do that? Tonight should be quite an easy um, short session. All right, so just in terms of ethics, just a reminder, or if you could remind me, particularly in Queensland, where are the, what are the two main documents that one would look to to determine the nature of ethical obligations for solicitors and barristers? Essentially the rules, the conduct rules. Nice, easy warm-up question. Code of conduct, not sure about the code of conduct. Bar association, we're getting closer. So. Legal practitioners board. Yeah, legal practitioners board, but barristers are. Ah, so I'm looking for the actual documents. So Dan's got the, Dan's got the first one. It's actually called, oddly, it, it's called the, the barristers conduct rules, but the first line says um, these may be cited as the Barristers rule, plural, a singular. So that's the barristers rule. Remember that? It's a very short document. So you'll need to have that. Try and find that. If you can't, let us know through you crew and we'll try and give you a copy. So that's for Queensland. Now that's the 2011 version, but you can might you might be able to pick up on my handwritten note that it was amended in late 2016. So that's the Bar Association of Queensland. Barristers Conduct Rules. For solicitors, we have the solicitors rules. What's the actual name of the rules? Can you recall? All right, I'll, I'll let you see the book. Is it the Australian Solicitors Conduct Rules? Yep, That's I just it, got Jackie. that. That's it, Jackie. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Just in time. So the ASCR. All right, so the Australian Solicitors Conduct Rules. Um, this is the 2012 version. I think that's the most current version. This was the, the document I've got in front of me was updated to uh, mid-2014. So the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. Um, all right. So you're not, I don't expect you to know all of those rules, but I do expect you to know what I might call some of the fundamental duties. So if you had to describe the fundamental duties of a lawyer, in terms of conduct and ethics, what would you say? What's the, what are the fundamental duties? Any thoughts? All right, so we know that the, say the Australian, Australian yes? Uh, to treat your client uh, fairly and make sure that they will help them to make good decisions. Yeah, that's, that's fundamental. There's even one that goes overrides that. There is a duty that overrides the obligations oh, to the duty client. To the, court. to the courts and to the administration of justice. Yeah. You'll actually see that um, in different areas, but keep that in mind that where there is a, where there's a, 
a, a, I guess, a conflict between the um, what the client wants and what is um, in the best interests of the court, the interests of justice, then your obligation to the latter is paramount. So have a look at the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules <clears throat> and in particular, Rule 3.1, which is the duty uh, to the court and the administration of justice is paramount. That's where we start. The next rule that I want to bring to your attention is Rule 4 and in Rule... Well, actually, I'll just give you an example in uh, relation to the paramount duty. There was um, a case... Uh, involving a mediation where the it's, it's the legal services commissioner against Mullins which is 2006 LPT 12 and that case talked about the overriding obligation to a court which was extended so far as to deal with a mediation and um, even if the disclosure was adverse to the client's interest there was that overriding obligation Right, so the next one is Rule 4 of the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules provides for what are called other fundamental duties. So the fundamental duty, the paramount duty, is to the court and the administration of justice, 3.1. Then the other fundamental duties, but not paramount duties, are 4.1.1, act in the best interest of a client in any manner in which the solicitor represents the client. 4.1.2, be honest and courteous in all dealings in the course of legal practice. 4.1.3, deliver legal services competently, diligently, and as promptly as reasonably possible. So these, these are duties. Number 4.1.4, avoid any compromise to integrity or professional independence. And 4.1.5, comply with the rules and the law. So these ethical duties restate and reinforce the solicitor's fiduciary and common law duties to the client and their professional duties to the administration of justice. So these are not just aspirational issues. They're not just codes of best conduct. These are fundamental duties. And if one fails to comply with a fundamental duty, then you can expect there will be ramifications. Those ramifications may be uh, sanctions, they may be fines, they may be suspensions, or they may be being struck off. So there are a whole range of different penalties. I don't expect you to go through and read case law on this. You're welcome to do it if you like. Ah, Michael said, 2015 August is the latest version. Thank you very much. So that's from Law Council. So www.lawcouncil .asn.au forward slash files forward slash web hyphen pdf forward slash aus underscore solicitors underscore conduct underscore rules dot pdf. Thank you, Michael. And I know Michael will probably share that on um, Ucrew. And if you do, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. So that's um, rule four. Rule five is a general rule which is cast in the negative the other rules have been positive obligations this is a negative obligation this is a negative uh, statement solicitor not to conduct engage in conduct in the course of practice or otherwise which demonstrates the solicitor is not a fit and proper person to practice law or is likely to a, a material degree be prejudicial or to or diminish the public confidence in the administration of justice or bring the profession into disrepute so that's a wide obligation not to do something that will bring lawyers generally into disrepute. I mean, when we have those, um, those silly, I say they're silly because we tend to lose. Um, when they have those um, uh, surveys which say, you know, which profession do you trust? Lawyers are not always, we're not at the bottom. There's usually a few below us, but we're, we're sort of well down. And I say that silly. And, and those of you that are teachers and nurses and um, uh, law enforcement officers that rank up the top, my apologies uh, for that earlier comment. I'm being facetious, of course. 
All right, so that's rule five. Rule six is a mechanical rule. This is really important. Undertakings, you need to understand what an undertaking is, how it might be given, what are the different forms of undertaking, and what are the ramifications if you fail to comply as a lawyer with an undertaking. So that's rule six. And rule 6.1 says, a solicitor who has given an undertaking in the course of legal practice must honour that undertaking and ensure the timely and effective performance of the undertaking unless released by the recipient or by a court of competent jurisdiction. So that raises a few issues. You know, what is a court of competent jurisdiction? Can I, can I go to, you know, QCAT and get, get a release from an undertaking? I don't know. Um, or do I have to go to the Supreme Court? I'm saying I don't actually don't know the answer to that. I haven't looked at that question. But it's an interesting one. But you need to know what is an undertaking and you need to know um, what it, when it's given. 6.2 says a solicitor must not seek from another solicitor or that solicitor's employee, associate or agent, undertakings in relation to a matter that would require the cooperation of a third party who is not party to the undertaking. See, that's, that's interesting because that's saying don't set up your colleague to fail by asking for an undertaking where it involves the concurrence of a third party. See, the problem is that you, if you give an undertaking and you're relying on a third party, then you're taking a huge risk because you're doing something which is not entirely within your control. And the general rule is that you only give an undertaking if it's entirely within your control and you're properly authorised to do it. And if you're an employee, that your employer knows about it and specifically says you can give that undertaking because your undertaking as an employed solicitor will have an effect on the law firm or the government agency or the um, university or whoever it is that you happen to be working for as a lawyer. So honouring the undertaking is um, a professional obligation and <clears throat> there is just one little change to it and that is sometimes people give an undertaking on behalf of a client. So the argument there is that all you're doing is on behalf of somebody else giving an undertaking, it is not a personal undertaking. So if you're looking at the undertaking which is being given to you, just make sure that it is actually from the lawyer and not by the lawyer on behalf of someone else, which gives it a completely different flavour. And um, Dale Point, who's a leading commentator in this area says, an undertaking given to a third party or to another lawyer may be enforced by way of a civil claim for breach of contract if the requirements of a contract are met and that lawyer assumes no contractual liability to non-clients unless he or she undertakes a contractual relationship. So that's one possible ramification for a breach. Another is professional discipline, as I mentioned earlier. And it may even be if you give the undertaking to a court, that's a special category altogether. You give a ca an undertaking to a court, you don't comply with that undertaking, then that's a contempt of court. So now we're really getting serious. Um, so that's, and you can be jailed immediately for a contempt. Um, so when it comes to finding an undertaking, it might be contempt of court proceedings, it might be disciplinary proceedings, and the whole range of different options within that disciplinary regime, or it may even be a breach of contract. So that's some um, undertakings. And um, <clears throat> beyond that, uh, you need to um, understand that the reason the lawyer's undertaking is meant to be so important is this, that as a profession, we are collectively charged with a special function. And that special function is that we have an opportunity to participate in enforcement um, of the law. So our role as lawyers is to, in a way, do work which ensures that everyone, everyone complies with the law, including the government. So it's a special responsibility where you have as part of your challenge, part of your work um, opportunities, the, the chance to enforce laws against a government. All right, any questions about professional ethics, professional obligations, you know, where to look. You've given, I've given you an idea of the most important provisions. Okay. 
let's um, talk about the exam for a while. So I'm going to attempt to share the screen. I hope that I do so successfully. Let's see if this works. Could you just let me know with a little thumbs up or something that you're seeing the landing page for intro? Yep, see it. Great. All right. So you may have noticed this afternoon um, I've added something. Don't forget the unit evaluations are at the top left-hand corner while I'm at it, while I see it. Very important for me and for the university. Have your say. Nine out of 50 have completed. So it's only a small class, this one, small group. But I really want to see that get up to 25 quickly. So if you haven't had your say, it only takes a few minutes, they tell me, please do so. And you can uh, go into a draw to win an iPad or a $20 Coles mount uh, via Maya voucher. Okay, so below the um, video for last week, we now have an extract from the exam itself. So the assignment three or assessment number three is in the form of a take home paper, also known as a briefing paper, also known as an um, I suppose an online exam, but it's essentially a take-home paper. And you would have seen the take-home papers that I set for last year and uh, the year before. In this instance, we have something quite different to the previous exams that I've uploaded for you to consider on UCrew. This one is released on Thursday, the 8th of February at 4 p.m. Queensland. I'm working that day, I'm in tribunal. Um, I'm going to have to excuse myself at 4 p.m. to actually do the upload. If I'm a few minutes late, please excuse me. Um, but I'll try not to be late. And look, there is a chance that I might be a couple of minutes early. But at 4 p.m. on the 8th of February, I'll upload the examination. What I typically do is upload the exam in a couple of ways. Um, I'll usually go into the exam block and upload it so that you can find the exam through the link. Quite often I'll upload the exam in UCrew or I will um, send it to the students by email and I may even put it here on the landing page. So if you find multiple sources to the exam, don't be surprised or stressed, it's the same one. It's just that I'm providing you with, uh, I hope, every opportunity to find it. So I'll, I'll upload the exam in a number of ways, probably, um, at that time. But the main way that I try to concentrate on is to upload it through the link itself. It's in two parts, but both within the two parts, we have separate parts as well. And in a way, the two parts are, are quite arbitrary. But in broad terms, part A requires you to answer a question um, about legislation, a question about legal conduct and ethics, and a series of quick research tasks. The reason that they're lumped together is that essentially they all relate to research. And I'm just going to stop the share for a moment. Think about it. What have I tried to concentrate upon this unit? Well, one of them is legal research. Another is giving you the feeling that you have an ability to find where a matter is dealt with, which court uh, do you go to, which tribunal, what orders can be given by different courts, what are the orders that relate to the remedies that might relate to damages or equitable remedies, as we talked about earlier in, in the unit, things like specific performance and injunctions. So what does all that mean in a more practical sense? So the task in part A is essentially this. You need to use your research skills to answer some questions that go to the heart of practice as a lawyer 
what I typically do in these things is write, okay, you're a first year lawyer, here's the scenario, how do we go about doing it? We can't do that now, so I'm doing a, a little bit of a hybrid and I'm, I'm really saying, use your research skills to tell me something about this. Now, having said that, you might look at the questions, I know that straight away, you don't have to research it, I actually know it, if you do, good for you. But this exam is one that's conducted online with full resources to the internet, so you can look it up. Um, <clears throat> try not to Google it, try to, try to look it up properly. I'll give you a hint. For those of you that have con completed your toolkit well, you should be able to use it for, to complete part A. Because in your toolkit, I think the best ones, not everyone, but most of the best ones contain links to research sites. And the idea is that you get to the research quickly because you've got four hours, but four hours will go pretty quickly. If you don't know what you're doing, four hours will, will, will go very quickly indeed. If you know what you're doing, you might be able to knock over this exam in an hour and a half easy. So if you, if you finish after an hour and you think, well, that's, that's the best I can do, don't stress and think you've, you, you, you've failed. You've probably done very well. I'm not advocating it. I, I know a lot of people will stay on for four hours and, and I probably would, to be honest, if, if it was me, but that's just, that's just me. But if you get it done quicker, that's better. All right, so if you look at your toolkit and you think, well, this really isn't geared up to give me a lot of quick information about legal research, I recommend you go back and progressively update the toolkit. The idea of the toolkit is... You've presented it to me, I've given you feedback and I've given you a mark. That's only the start. That's just the introduction. The toolkit is now yours and you build on it. If you don't like what's in the toolkit, just get rid of it, scrap it and rebuild it. But make it a practical document as much as you can. So in the toolkit, we asked a lot of things about rule of law and doctrine of precedent and all that sort of stuff. If that's not actually going to help you in practice, then you can remove it. Um, but my, my thoughts are make sure that it's at least orientated to legal research. So if you can do that, then you'll be in a better stead to answer some of those research type questions. Now, the alternative for those of you that have looked at what I set as the briefing paper, the take home paper in term two 2017 and term through 2016 is you're a first year lawyer sitting in on a conference, you've taken notes about uh, what the client wants and the senior partner who's there with you says all right you've got two days to give me this advice and tell me what are the causes of action what court or tribunal do I go to uh, what are the remedies that I seek what are the cost implications things like that so think about part a in this examination kind of in a very bland way as along those lines okay does that make sense have you all actually looked at the exam papers that I set previously? You've had a look? Okay. Um, I did have one at the start. Yes, Ben? I've got a question about, about, that, uh, about the old exam papers, but I'll, I'll wait till the end. Okay. Um, at the start of term, I sort of toyed with two types of papers, and I did actually have another one written, but I thought, no, if I only give you four hours, it's not fair to give you something that involved. So the nature of this exam overall is much easier than it was for the other one. Uh, Mary says, where are they? They're, they're in U-Crew, aren't they? Did, uh, U Crew says Diane, yep. So just have a look in, uh, if you can't find them, just ask, put another post, can't find them, and uh, I'll, I'll reload them. But they should, if you just scroll down, you should be able to find them. Um, and also, I think I put the answers. Um, there, I'm not. I think I, I put um, the responses for both papers. Did I do that, Ben? Um, or Michael? Yep. yep. Okay. One, yep. not the other. Oh, so okay. I did feedback for uh, for <coughs> Ada and her. Uh, oh, yeah. Shop, uh, shopping center. Okay. All right. You probably only need it for one. Yeah. The feedback was for both, apparently, says Diane. All right, but anyway, have a look at that, um, and it'll give you an idea, but this is in the miniature. 
All right, so let's go back to looking at the examination. I'll share the screen. Okay, so we see the landing page again. Um, so part A yeah. is broadly based around legal research. It's based on you understanding what courts are able courts. to do. What things? Sorry, John. Yep. It's not the landing page. Sorry? It's not the landing page. Oh, so okay. Get the other one. I'll see if I can get it right this time. Is that the landing page? No? No, that's not. It's a desktop. Is it? Okay, sorry. I'll see if I can get this right. Were you watching yourselves on the screen? Was that the one I was showing you? No, it was, was the it the front page of the assessment. Okay. Oh, was it the picture of the beach, Vic Beach? Okay. No, 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 it was the paper, assessment paper, front page. Yeah, and the background was the beach, yeah. Oh, oh the beach, okay. okay. All right, well, so what we're looking to do is share the screen for... I just wonder if... Um, so it's the landing page of Moodle. I'm just, I'm just a bit confused as to what I'm doing wrong because I thought I was taking to the right space. That's why I was asking you what, what you're seeing. All right, so are you seeing the front landing page of Moodle or have I still got it wrong? My apologies. Can you see the have your say button? No? No. Still wrong. Okay. My apologies. Is that it? Surely is. Oh, we got it finally. Okay. Um, that was confusing to me. Sorry. All right. So what we have here is the landing page of Moodle, and you'll see that there's extracts from the examination. Part B is much more standard, where I ask you to complete four essay questions. Each of them are worth five marks. So you can see that... Um, uh, for part A, it's worth 20 marks. Part e, B is worth 20 marks, making a total of 40 marks. You've already completed 60 marks worth of assessment. There are no options in this paper. Now, the reason I've done that is I want you to consider everything that we've done in the course, not just selectively uh, gamble on what it is. I would tend to do that where the paper is relatively easy but I should say this, those of you that have done the work will find this relatively easy. If you haven't worked during semester, you might find it tough. But that's probably the same for everything in life. So just a few notes, working to a short deadline, submitting word as part of the assessment. You must have it completed by Thursday, 8th of February at 8 p.m. Queensland time. If you don't have an extension, you can't complete the task after that time. And unlike usual assessments, there's no opportunity to apply for, you know, to, or to be given the benefit of a late penalty or apply for extension. So this is it. It's like the sit-down exam, but you do it at your desk. I don't return the final take-home paper or provide personalised feedback, but I do provide generalised feedback, and you've seen the sort of feedback um, from previous years. Now, what you do with this one is you upload the assessment through Moodle just in the ordinary way. So the ordinary way that you submit an assessment, you do it here. As you normally do, at least with my units, everything in the one document, please, uh, including your outline of submissions. That's a mistake. I'll take that phrase out because there is no outline of submissions. Um, that will be in a single word document so not in multiple parts, but just mark it clearly, part A, you know, uh, whatever, or however I've designated it in your paper. So for words and marks, the word count does not include material in footnote referencing. That's a standard rule for me. So if you find that you've got 
much more to say than the words available to you. An easy workaround is pop more in the footnotes. I probably shouldn't tell you that, but it's pretty obvious. If you include something as a direct quote, then you would include that in the text and it does form part of the word count. So if you're struggling to, um, if, if you're struggling for content, then draw a quote and put it directly into the answer and that'll boost your word count a bit. Um, but I do allow some flexibility. So if you go over, then I'll be looking to see if what you've done is worthwhile. And if it is, I won't be as concerned. But don't, don't go wildly over. And of course, as usual, you must reference your work in accordance with the AGLC. Now, does everyone have a good handle on the Australian Guide to Legal Citations? It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Does everyone struggle? I mean, I've got to say, some students still have trouble with footnote referencing. To me, footnoting is really simple. If you're having trouble with referencing or even just using the word program, just ask a question. We'll try and help collectively. All right. Um, so I'm sure that you'll have your guide to the Australian Guide to Legal Citations handy, or you would have studied that before the exam. Even though it is, if you like, I'm, I'm not supposed to call it an exam, it's an online paper. So it's an online paper, you've got a short time period, but I still expect you to reference your work wherever you may source that work. Make sure that you reference the author of the work. Okay, all good. Hopefully that's the right, correct page again. Don't tell me I've done it again. All right, so we're back to the um, examination and you'll see there's a basic rubric. Don't get too hung up on rubrics, um, but what I'm looking for is under, your understanding of the ability to understand legal concepts. And if, if you're going for the highest marks, can you identify and discuss concepts while exercising professional judgment? Explore legal issues. Can you identify key legal issues, reference appropriately, and then have a clear understanding of those legal issues about how different fields of law connect? Communication is important. Problem solving, research skills, and professional presentation. All right, I'll stop the share now. That's probably all that I can tell you about the examination at this stage. Does anyone have any questions about the exam? Next week we'll talk briefly, but actually later this evening we'll talk about some exam techniques and uh, go into next week as well. No other questions? Good. All right, so that's what we have to do for the exam. Um, just get yourself as well prepared as you can. Look, usually at this stage I get you to do a redrafting exercise. I might put that on you, crew and you can do that at your leisure. But I won't go through it tonight because it's not on the exam and um, I don't want to burden you with something that's not directly going to be referable to the examination. But I'll put this on you, crew, and you can have a look. The topic for this week is actually to do with um, self-management and I will make a few comments about that. Self-management is critically important. You might recall in week one, I think we talked about self-management. I probably started by telling you that being involved in law studies and law practice is stressful. You need to look after your mental health, your well-being. You need to acknowledge that you will be under pressure and you need to prepare for that. That's the same as a law student, it's the same as in practice. So have you all undertaken ways of coping with pressure, keeping fit, looking after your diet? Collaborating in a positive way, smacking a golf ball, yep, that's what I do in part. Uh, you know, these are all important things, but you've got to look, you've got to work your way backwards, and I say that a lot. Think about what you want to achieve, how you want to achieve it, uh, and then work from there. So, and remember, of course, that depression is a very high incident in um, lawyers. Talking with other students is good, yep. 
So there's a lot of good things that you um, do. Just um, also dealing with feedback, the feedback that I give, I try to make it as positive, as constructive as I can without going too far. But often I do need to bring to your attention things that are wrong. So in the second assessment, what I tried to do is highlight issues about problems um, that you may face and um, issues about uh, how to how to present something in a, in a proper manner. Look, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to quickly put into a Word document some nonsense and then just show you some a technique that I used in part when it came to marking the assessment. I think I did show you this early on. If I did, excuse me, but this will serve as a refresher. Judging by the quality of the work, I suspect that I did show you this, and I think people might have been aware of it and um, coped with it. So you should now see a Word document. That's the nonsense that I'll put on the um, on Ucrew for you to redraft. The idea of that is to get it down to 100 words but still convey the message. All right, so what I did, and something that you might want to do before you submit work, is go up to top left-hand corner, File, Options, Proofing, and just check the settings. So what I'm looking for is problems with all these things. And then ask for it to recheck the document and go OK. Now, what should happen? Although I'm using the online version of Word and it's a little slower and not as detailed, it should show up problems with the red and um, blue underlining. There's only a few there. It's actually not as bad as I thought. But what it's done is it's highlighted um, some passive language. So if I highlight on that red underlining, it says consider using the active voice. And I, I think you all know that that's one of my little things. It also will show up spelling and grammar issues. So even though I'm saying it's nonsense, it's actually not too bad. But when I do run that program, which I invariably do for the second assessment of Introduction to Law, I'm really looking for all the little things. And if in the um, feedback uh, I, I said to you things like you didn't paginate, you've written in the um, passive voice too often, uh, you failed to reference your material, blah, blah, blah. A lot of those you might say, well, that's pretty minor. But what we want to do is just, it's probably the only time we'll tell you, make sure it's done correctly from now on. And that's just one technique that you can use in order to um, present the best work that you can. Um, was there any questions about the feedback for all the second assessment while we're at it? No questions? All good? All right. So the point is that the feedback that you get won't always be positive. Take it in your stride. Think about the big picture and uh, try and, when, it's, when it comes to stress, try and harness it, try and embrace it and think, this is great. This is my, my opportunity. You know, I'm given an opportunity now to be actually in the front line um, and enjoy that process, enjoy what it feels like. All right, while um, we're talking about other things, I just want to mention some things that about international law. I know this is, re this is just going to be really brief, but Chapter 14 of the text talks about being globally minded. We really aren't going to get to Chapter 14 much, but I do want you to have a look at it. A couple of things that you might want to um, bear in mind, that international conventions do have a part to play in our law. So I teach environmental law and we talk about some international conventions, but probably the most common international convention that you'll hear about in practice of law is the, uh, the convention that relates to dealing with abduction cases of, child overseas, uh, of a child overseas by a parent. Does anyone know what that convention is? What is the convention that deals with abduction, abduction cases?
Hague. That's it. The Hague Convention. The full term is the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. I had a special reason for mentioning that, and that is that I've had the pleasure of being in the Hague um, very recently. Has anyone been to the Hague? It's a great place. Um, and if you do go, it's a really good city to, uh, to visit. You can get there uh, from Amsterdam on a train, and, and it takes about 40 minutes. And you can go and see the Peace Palace. You can see the International Court of Justice and the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Um, and you can see the um, International Criminal Court. So uh, often in the news. All right, so coming back to international law, um, I think we all know Comley and uh, we know how to uh, access that information. Um, Bali is another one. These are the offs these are the ones that are associated with Ostley. And Ostley, by the way, is A, capital A, small UST, and then capital L, capital I, capital I. In a couple of you, I pulled a couple of you on that. I was really looking for small things when I got to that stage. Um, so remember, of course, that there are different um, ways in which law is practiced. Um, we have the common law system, um, England does, United States does, but the other probably more often used system is the civil law system that's pretty much adopted throughout Europe, Asia and South America. Um, so there are differences when you're reading material, uh, it has a different emphasis upon it. Okay, let's... Um, finalize things for tonight with some specific readings so you can um, prepare for your exam. I'm just going to take you to specific pages of this text. I'll run through this again perhaps next week but um, page 13 deals with work sectors. So when you're reviewing the text have a look at page 13 and just think I've tailored this course for those people that wish to practice in law not necessarily in a law firm um, but sometimes as a barrister uh, in a government agency or practice as part of a, a corporate sphere um, or in a company. And you'll see that um, litigation is not just for barristers in private practice. You'll see there are six groups of lawyers on the right-hand side of the page and all must have a knowledge of how and where matters are considered. So even though an emphasis of mine is know which courts deal with what and where and how and what are their jurisdictional limits, etc. If you look at that chart on page 13 with work sectors, you'll see that all of those people need to know something about the legal system and how it works in, in practice. The next is on page 25. It deals with the Priestly 11. You'll hear that from time to time. So the Priestly 11 doesn't cover all areas of practice, but it's a good starting point in um, uh, determining the differences of different areas of law. So when you're considering a legal question, you need to consider that it may, the response or the answer may come from any wonder of a number of areas of law. And that chart gives you an idea of the areas of law, at least as a starting point. Next, have a look at page 26. Page 26 provides for the threshold learning outcomes for law. And um, the take-home paper will certainly test you in terms of number one knowledge it will test you in number two ethics and professional responsibility number three thinking skills definitely number four research skills that's an emphasis number five communication yes uh, and collaboration and number six self-management not so much but self-management is probably the most important out of all of those but the ones that are being examined in the take-home paper of the other five. Page 28 deals with learning effectively. So what I, another emphasis in this course is this. Um, what I'm trying to do is concentrate on you learning rather than me teaching, which seems odd seeing I seem to do all the talking. As I've said to you before, I'm not so much interested in you knowing the answers immediately, but being able to access the answers and understand the process. My examination, my online paper, it, the intention is that we, we test your ability to find things out. 
So there might be things on the paper that we've never even discussed, but I expect you to be able to find out and research. Does that make sense? Again, if you happen to know the answer, well, you do, that's good. Um, and page 45 deals with the categories of law. I mean, law can be substantive or procedural, it can be public or private, it can be civil or criminal, it can be domestic or international. It's a whole lot of different ways that it can be categorised. Have a look at that flowchart on page 46 and um, you'll see that it's divided into constitutional, administrative, criminal, taxation, and then there's private law, which is um, also divided into different areas of practice. Have a look at um, page 49, the purposes of law, the six of them there in that flowchart. And what usually happens is that in the exam, you're given a scenario and you have to um, uh, somehow work out which is the best way to resolve an issue for a client. This paper is not so much like that. Page 96 deals with the distinction between common law and equity. So have a look at page 96. Make sure you know what we mean by common law. What do we mean by equity? Um, what are the remedies? What's a common law remedy? What's an equitable remedy? Maybe some of them fit, fit in both camps. Know where you can obtain these remedies. Can you walk into uh, a tribunal and ask for certain remedies? Can you walk into the Supreme Court and ask for certain remedies? I mean, where are the best places to go to ask for these things? Page 124, that's out federal and state uh, relations. You know that um, federal will override state. That's because of the Constitution. But is the matter that you have before you a federal matter or a state matter? The main thing, I guess, would be to look at the legislation. If it's state legislation, odds are it's a state matter. If it's federal legislation, odds are it's going to be dealt with in a federal court. But not always. For example, if there's a prosecution of a matter under federal legislation, odds are you're going to have that prosecution dealt with in a state court. Seems odd, but that's the way it is. So sometimes the court in which you are dealing is dependent upon the area of practice. Is it criminal law or civil law? If in general terms, if it is a, a federal piece of legislation and it's civil based, you'll be in a federal court. As a general rule, if it is federal, federal legislation and it's criminal law, you'll be dealt with in the state jurisdiction. So have a look at page 165. It sets out some of the um, uh, jurisdictional limits. Again, that's all part of, isn't it? It's all part of knowing which court to go to. Part of it is dependent upon the amount of money that we're talking about. So you'll need to know the court system. You'll need to know the jurisdictional limits for the courts and the tribunals. Remember, QCAT's a bit of a trick because... It's got its minor civil dispute uh, jurisdiction, but other than that, it's unlimited. Page uh, 179 talks about the difference between common law damages and equitable remedies, such as injunctions or specific performance. Have a look at that. I want you to understand what we mean by these different remedies. When do you ask for these remedies to be made available to your client? And where do you go to ask these remedies? So you need to know what is meant by damages, what's meant by injunction, specific performance, and which are equitable, which are common law. Page 189 deals with legal research skills, and that's important um, always. So have a look at your toolkit again. Make sure you're happy with it because you're actually going to use it for your exam. When you look at your toolkit, does it work for you? Here are some of the things you've got to ask yourself. Does it provide a systematic approach to my research? Does it help me to plan my research? Um, does it provide ready links? 
so that I can undertake my research quickly? Is it set out in a way that makes sense to me? And am I accessing good quality materials? For example, if I ask you to cite a case, you're going to cite the authorised report for me, aren't you? And you need to know where to find the authorised report. Do you find the authorised reports in Ostley? Probably not. Sometimes you do, but probably not. So you need to know which site to go to to get the authorised report. If you cite me the right case, but it's an unauthorised citation, you'll probably get half marks, but you won't get full marks. Um, have a look at your interpretation skills, which is Chapter 7. And then, of course, think about Chapter 8 with thinking skills. Creative thinking is important. Think about your communication skills. What makes a good communicator? What do you do to improve your communication skills in writing and verbal? Collaboration, etc. So these are all examinable areas. And I'm sorry that I'm not narrowing it down more than that. You probably want me to tell you exactly what areas are in the exam and I won't do that for you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, page 165. All right. Um, oh, yes. So thank you, Michael. You've typed out the full name of the convention. And that's on page 165, is it? All right. But it's the Hague Convention on Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction or the Hague Abduction Convention. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, I said it would be short and I've done it again. Are there any questions? Because now's a good time to ask. You've been very patient with me, as always. Thank you. John, I've just got a, a general question. Um, and it relates to both of the um, sample papers. Now, I was reading through both of them and I was picking through the facts, you know, just trying to pull the, the facts out and put together a, um, uh, the, you know, you meant to put together a, um, a brief. Now, would it be appropriate or right to, if, I, if I'm reading through it and I'm seeing, as I'm reading through, seeing what someone might counter with, so seeing it from another point of view. Oh, that's a great way to do it. Both of, absolutely both of fabulous. Yeah, both of them had big features where you'd go, well, you know, if I made point A, they'd come back, the other side might come back with point B. Is that a good thing to include in, in a briefing? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's a great way to do it. Um, I'm really pleased you raised that because what it does is mean that you've got to look at your toolkit and incorporate that approach. So when you toolkit, you've, you've certainly got to identify your preferred legal reasoning, whether it's Mirat, Sirat, Iraq, whatever it might be, that's the one that works for you. And incorporate into that, what would your opponent come up with? That's excellent. That's really sort of out of war type stuff, isn't it? Um, but it, it's very important in practice. So yes, absolutely. Good approach. All right. Because I was thinking that might be something, if, if you were going down, you know, the litigation path, that would definitely be something you would you would you know have to think of tactically, but but I wondered if even at the, at the early stages, it's something you might formulate and think about, start to think about. Absolutely, if okay. you can give clear advice, which is against proceeding or against what the client wants to say, you need to be brave to do that, but it can be very worthwhile. Yep. You don't want litigation for two years a lot of expense and then the client say why didn't you tell me that at the start so think about that at the start is a great tactic good right. question good approach anything else thanks just could i ask just quickly with the um take home paper then where it says um this is um like your own work no colluding etc etc does that mean that if we are stuck on something we can't just ask a question on you crew for anyone who might pick up yeah look the answer is you you can yeah. um but we've got to be a bit careful about it well, um, that's okay. yeah because 
yeah, so just just be just be a bit careful about that. Um, just when I had signed on to Ucrew towards the end of last term, I was watching comments when they were obviously doing their like day and a half assessment and it seems like they were throwing a few different things around so I wasn't sure if that was the norm or not the norm. But they, they certainly were but my approach to that assessment was very different to my approach to this one in that while I'm saying to you yours is relatively easy I was, I was warning them for weeks saying you, you're going to get hit and you'll read this and you'll cry. Um, but work your way through it, keep a cool head, think logically, work through your toolkit and try and identify the material facts, the issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it'll start to, to come good. I said, but you can collaborate and I want you to collaborate on this. So I actually phys I encourage them to collaborate to get okay. the best answer. Subject, okay. of course, to the answer being the best that you can give. Yep. But That's if the question that you have in the exam is really straightforward, with a, just a single answer, you probably don't want to share that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. All right. Good questions. Any other questions? All good? Okay. Thank you very much for attending tonight. Those of you that are watching this session, please um, ask any questions through you, crew. We'll see you next Monday, but it'll be an easy session. And uh, it'll be particularly easy because some of you will be doing the statutory interpretation um, exam next Monday. Okay. All the best. We'll see you then. Bye.